Before we begin, is Ms. Derya Akhtash here? Because I don't see her. And I don't see Dr. Ali. It's OK. Uh, professor? <laughs> Може да седнете вие на првото, па после да ги викнем другите гости. Да. So welcome to the last uh, panel, um, like last session for today, uh, which is a panel discussion. Uh, with this, we actually will conclude uh, all of the teaching activities uh, that have to happen within the International Staff Week. So once more, I would like to thank everyone for their participation, both here and online, uh, through all of our panels. Well, of course, like we have like presentations like tomorrow as well of universities, if anybody is interested in networking or any type of cooperation. Um, however, uh, hi, Professor. Uh, however, we will now uh, begin with the topic, uh, with the panel discussion on the topic, the effect of the war in Ukraine and the energy crisis uh, on the Balkans and the wider region. For this purpose, uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Law, Professor Nikola Datev, is going to moderate, whereas our guests are uh, Professor uh, Dobrinka Chankova. Again? Yes, I'm if you could have a seat over here, please. Uh, Professor Milan Yazbet. And Professor Ulke Evrim Uysal. I wish you a product, productive discussion, and the floor is yours. There you go, Professor. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I have the honor to, to moderate this uh, discussion today. Uh, the topic that we have is uh, the effects of the war in Ukraine and the energy crisis in the Balkan and the wider region. Uh, all the uh, speakers have five minutes for a presentation, short presentation, speech. Uh, although I know it's impossible to, 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 say, uh, uh, to say a lot in five minutes, especially because this topic is very, very comprehensive and it can be analyzed from different perspectives. Uh, and then we're going to have a uh, discussion. We'll start with the uh, uh, only female. Ladies uh, first? Uh, ladies yes. first, yes. Okay. I accept this role. First of all, I would like to apologize that uh, you are preoccupied with me the whole day today. <laughs> but this is simply a coincidence of the fact. Uh, but you know, the cowboy job is never done. <laughs> and if there is one more session today, maybe I will also take part. <laughs> <laughs> In the evening session, okay, it's uh, absolutely okay. So, uh, I, that's, for that reason, I try to change a little bit my uh, interface uh, and not to be so boring for you. Hopefully it is not disturbing. Uh, and, but back to the business, to the main business, because, um, yes, the time is flying. So, I would like immediately to say that on this time, team, I do not consider myself as the biggest expert in the world, but however, I have an opinion from legal point of view, and I would like to share it with you. So, uh, I would like to start with this, that I'm a convinced pacifist, and undercover, undercover, a representative of the Pugwash movement, if this movement exists today, Pugwash movement, that's Probably the audience is well informed. These are scientists against war, led uh, by Albert Einstein and some Russell and some many other famous scientists. Uh, I do not know uh, whether this uh, movement is very active today, but I consider myself as a part of this movement. And of course, uh, I would like to start with this that I'm strongly against every war and especially against the current war, Russian-Ukrainian war. Uh, the war, in my opinion, and according to the law, it's a last resort remedy uh, for resolving uh, such big conflicts and crises. But mm, I would like also call Karl Marx's theory, uh, which is very difficult to be denied, that the development of the capitalist, uh, mm, the capitalist world generates periodically different crises, economics, financial, etc. And they are 
imminent part of the capitalism. So uh, it's clear, it is uh, for theorists, politicians, etc., that uh, this crisis should be resolved somehow. The question is whether the war is the decision of this crisis that are, as I mentioned, uh, a part of uh, the capitalist development. Uh, of course, this is not the best decision. This is the final decision. The war, not desired decision, uh, with many, many uh, counterproductive results. And asking about the effect of the war, I would like to give immediately my answer. The main effect is that this war made all of us, not only the people from Russia and from Ukraine and from the neighboring countries, all of us victims. Although secondary, uh, at that stage, and I believe never real victim, but we are all victims. And that's why I'm so strongly against this war, not political discussion on this, but because our sense of security is strongly affected. We are living on permanent stress. We are stopped to make great plans, but we started to pay great prices of all products, uh, oil, uh, gas, etc., etc. The next important legal implication of the war is the refugee problem. The refugee problem is also a big issue, especially for Bulgaria. I do not know about many other countries, but Turkey definitely also, uh, or some other. And this is highly controversial, highly controversial issue about refugees, especially in today's dimensions, especially in Bulgaria, where some people raised even the question of positive discrimination of the refugees from this war uh, in comparison with the refugees from other war wars. So this is uh, also legal, very important legal implication of this war. I, I am also very strongly against this war because the free movement of people was so much restricted. And I do believe that one day uh, we'll do not be uh, even more affected from this war. But nevertheless, the main mm, opinion, the main effect of the war, I see that it uh, nurtures a sense of victimhood of people from, from countries, from neighboring countries, from whole Europe. And this is really something that we should take into account and oppose. I will not speak very much. I will try to be shorter because I have spoken enough today. And now I use this opportunity to, to pass the floor to my colleague. <laughs> yes? Actually, perfectly on time. You had 10 seconds left. Oh! <laughs> so, Professor, right. there is no place for restorative justice. In this oh, it's too late. <laughs> it's too late. When there is a war, it's too late for restorative justice. <laughs> Professor Elbert, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if this will be good for the panel or not, but I agree basically with everything what colleague uh, Dubrinka said. So, but I don't say this because I would not have anything to add, but I agree with this uh, notion. And of course, I was, uh, how should I say, my, my, uh, my uh, the bell started to ring uh, when hearing you saying a cowboy job is never done. Yes. Mariska Veres, middle of the road, was it? The band, late 60s? I think uh, it was Cher. That yeah, but this is a new one. <laughs> oh, maybe this is, a, this is a new interpretation. Oh, You're young, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it comes from late 60s, you know? And uh, so, uh, uh, I didn't say this before, but now, now I can add, also diplomat job is never done, eh? Yeah, yeah. Fully but you know, I want, to say, uh, I want to make another parallel. I can't recall the name of the singer. There are also many in different interpretations. At the end of 60s, there, there was a hit, war. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Google, you will see. I mean, it's a, you know, in the, in the time of the Vietnam War, it was a uh, black American singing, African American, whatever Edwin it was. Edwin Starr. Huh? Edwin Starr. Edwin Starr, yes, yes. Oh, I mean, good. Help. Just listen, the... listen to, 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 right. the, to the lyrics, and you will see, 
we will find the an absolute answer to this our topic. War, what is it due to war? Absolutely nothing, nothing, and once again nothing. So, uh, consequences, uh, two, two points. Um, uh, war is uh, forbidden by the United Nations founding charter. This says everything. So war is forbidden uh, for, 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 uh, as such. So war cannot be, must not be, a means of solving open issues. There are other approaches according to the many structures that we have in the today's world, uh, internationalizations, mechanisms, and so on. So these all are means how to solve open issues between two sides when they appear, and not by war. But uh, I think we can say that in this case, uh, the war in Ukraine, provoked by the Russian aggression, or by the aggression of the Russian of Putin's regime, I think it would be better to say Putin's regime, as we were saying that also uh, Bosnia was a victim of aggression of the Milosevic regime, not of Serbia, of Milosevic regime. So this, in this case, that war is only an excuse for a goals that, that are there in, in, the, in the top of the regime. I would believe that it goes, uh, that is, it, it is uh, an excuse for a confrontation between democratic regimes and authoritarian. By the way, from this point of view, the election of uh, Da Silva in Brazil is highly important because it weakened the global alliance or whatever of autocrats. Uh, uh, so, uh, consequences uh, on security and the integration aspect of the Western Balkans. I, I think these two aspect, aspects are very important. Of course, also energy, but this is everywhere. But, but for the Western Balkans, especially on the security area and on the integration area. And here, um, I don't know how to put it, that it will not uh, sound, uh, how should I say, irrespective. There is one positive uh, issue coming out of those consequences. Uh, it happened like, j just, I think it more or less happened that the new Slovene government that started in, in, in uh, early, late, late May, immediately, at that time, there was a proposal to, to deliver the status of the EU candidate country to Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia. So to, uh, Georgia, Georgia, so to Ukraine, Ukraine and uh, Georgia received this. At the same time, the Slovene government, the new government, also launched diplomatic action to be the same with Bosnia and Herzegovina. The, the, uh, uh, of course, diplomatic action was very uh, short limited because of the new government. You have to prepare such diplomatic actions for on a longer period, half year or something. But uh, the June European Council, as, as we remember, made a conclusion that it will uh, uh, have this topic on the agenda once again in December. And as far as it looks like now, at least in the lobbies, diplomatic lobbies uh, around the EU, there is a strong chance that Bosnia and Herzegovina will receive in the December meeting of the European, uh, European Council uh, candidate status, status of the candidate country for the EU. So if this is the case, I think it will be. This is one of the, this is a positive outcome or spin-off or I don't know how to say to which, which term to use because it is difficult to use positive terms when we speak about the war atrocities and so on. But you, you see, I want to point out the diplomatic skill and the, uh, the, 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 to have in mind mantra to use each opportunity for a diplomatic initiative, diplomatic effort, diplomatic success. So if this happens, I think this will be extremely important for the situation in the Western Balkans from various points of view. From one point of view, it will prevent the spillover effect of, of conflict of conflict or war mantra from Ukraine battlefield to the Balkans. Things are very serious as you know. But if this happens, it will be a contra effect against this spillover. Then next it will for sure bring a positive uh, energy to the and to revive the integration process. European integration the process in the Western Balkans is an estimate for a decade. From 2012 when, when Croatia entered the last so far member, member country. So this, uh, this I see two very important uh, issues, two very important let's say, consequences. It might affect also the Macedonian Bulgarian open issue to put it diplomatically and then some other issues. So I see here these two points as a 
positive issues that I think I, I should, uh, I have to, I have to uh, point out here. Um, the last sentence, uh, uh, I think uh, that this also supports the very idea of the open Balkans uh, initiative. I think this initiative, I was seen in Skopje, yeah, North Macedonia, when this uh, started, uh, as the ambassador, when, when this started, I think this is a very important initiative because it shows the local capabilities to materialize this, what is the very, what is the, the very essence of the European integration process. Of course, it is not a, a compensation for the European integration the membership. On, those who speak this, they are manipulating. They cannot be serious. This is one step closer to it. That's the point. That's the point because in the uh, idea of the European integration and enlargement, it's not only that it is not that the candidate country must wait till negotiation process begins and then it starts adopting a key. Each aspirant country should start adopting a key before that happens. If this, uh, I remember my first meeting with the, the then uh, Macedonian Minister of Environment, it was late 2016, I said to him, I can't recall the name anymore, I'm sorry. I apologize for this. He, I, I said to him, I was shocked when I learned that during winter time, Skopje and Tetua are among the most polluted cities in the world. Hey, come on. I said to the minister, Minister, what are you waiting for? Start adopting the key on the, on, on the environmental uh, uh, package and you will, you will improve your living quality. This is the point of the EU. No, no, no. We wait for this negotiation. So I hope that this uh, issue will, will move or change that, that matter. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ulke Musa. Thank you. Uh, I actually completely agree with, with you about uh, being a pacifist, uh, especially against the conflicts and wars. Uh, but if you allow me, let me tell you a personal story of mine about uh, the war. I'm, I'm actually a peace child, and I have never seen war in my life. Uh, I grew up in peace. Uh, so war for me for long years was a distant reality that I started to watch on television with the Gulf War in 1991 after the Gulf crisis when uh, United States and allies invaded uh, Iraq and I was watching uh, on television when I was a kid and this was like shocking to me but perhaps to everyone I guess because this was the, on the first uh, conflict uh, that was broadcasted online uh, on live uh, and that was something uh, like a documentary that we watched but that was real uh, and that was uh, destructive uh, and that was war and then uh, when I grew up uh, and I witnessed the uh, disintegration of Yugoslavia uh, the war in Bosnia uh, the conflicts in Macedonia and uh, the other wars uh, between Serbia and Croatia and when I grow up and I understand this is kind of a, uh, not a television show, but, but a reality uh, really happening to people when I see the refugees, uh, when I read about it, and then I study political science and international relations, it became uh, more and more uh, destructive in my life, despite I never experienced uh, war. Uh, and one day uh, I, I discovered the fact when I was uh, reading about the uh, genealogy of my uh, heritage and uh, my parents, I discovered that my both great-great-fathers, grandfathers, they fought against each other uh, in the Crimean War uh, in the uh, uh, 1850s. Uh, so they were enemies and actually they were on the same battlefield. Uh, that made me shock uh, in a while, but I understand that uh, this uh, killing each other is so meaningless uh, and if one of them, one of them uh, were dead, and I wouldn't be <laughs> here, uh, when I consider that, uh, and also uh, peace is kind of an interval between wars, because in the human history, throughout the human history, we have been killing each other, uh, and I don't believe there is a wrong and right in this uh, fighting uh, sides. I mean, uh, there is a certain point of uh, there is an invader, for example, in, in this current situation. Uh, there is no point discussing it that Russia is invading Ukraine. 
Uh, but on the other hand, uh, in the same situation, uh, for maybe a century later, uh, the invading side could be different. Uh, so I completely agree with your uh, point of view. Uh, we will, we can discuss it forever, as uh, His Excellency said, uh, in the BM Charter, in the United uh, Nations Charter. The war is forbidden, uh, but I think everyone uh, is violating this uh, charter uh, when the turn comes. So, uh, that's all for me. Uh, as a personal, two minutes uh, left, okay. Sorry? I'm like, with two minutes left, okay. <laughs> Shall I continue? <laughs> <laughs> You'll have time on the second question. Right, thank you. Thank you. I, 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 was, I was not prepared, but I would like to share also a personal uh, history of mine. And I also find it completely meaningless. But unfortunately, uh, as I said, uh, peace is kind of an interval, and we have been uh, ongoing in war since the beginning of history, it seems. And I have actually no hope for the future. Thank you very much. We can give an applause to our panelists. Yes. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you for expressing your opinions. Uh, Okay, so before we before we go before we go um, with, the, with the questions from the from my colleagues from the audience, I would like to ask you uh, one question, and it can be one follow up, especially follow up question, especially for for Uke. Um, what is your what is your prediction uh, when the war will come to an end? Will come to an end this winter, 2023? Uh, and uh, how the Balkan countries in the, the wider region uh, can react if they face with some additional, let's say, security economic problems. Huh? And a follow-up, sorry, for, for, for also you can, you, can, uh, you can express your opinion, but I think this question is more for Ulke, uh, the role of Turkey. Uh, how, uh, how, uh, if, uh, so what's... what's uh, uh, how, how Turkey can help or can mediate on a global, global scale? Uh, about Russian about Ukrainian the Russian war. Ukrainian conflict of war, yes. All right. Who is the first now? Is there no process? Okay, thank you. Is there process? We are again on restorative justice terrain. Circular, where we began. I think Turkey has. Uh, now, as a special point, uh, Turkey is a NATO country, a dedicated NATO member, uh, and a member of the alliance uh, more than uh, seven decades. On the other hand, Turkey is pursuing friendly relationship with Russia. Uh, Russia became Turkey's uh, leading partner in business, uh, especially in terms of tourism and more investments. And both countries share a common history. But Turkey's point here is, uh, we should not deceive ourselves, uh, is completely pro-Ukrainian. When we look at the side, uh, Turkey is following NATO's uh, procedures. And uh, on the other hand, uh, I think the Turkish government, although I do not approve their policies in many ways, I don't want to go in detail because there is a recording. <laughs> there's a live stream. Uh, but, but on the other hand, it's a live stream. Oh, yeah, it's fantastic. Even worse. The worst. <laughs> on the other hand, Turkey could be, could be a, a, a point of negotiation, uh, could be a point of solution. Uh, I think Turkey was the first country to offer uh, peace talks uh, to both sides, uh, and the venue was offered in uh, Istanbul. Uh, and actually, uh, diplomacy did not prevail at that time, uh, and if there is a hope for to end the war, I, I believe my country will play an important role uh, as a not NATO member, but also a partner of Russia in terms of trade. Uh, could be a mediating point between these two uh, two fighting cousins. Actually, <laughs> uh, sorry for using that. Uh, that's why I find it completely meaningless. Also. Uh, and furthermore, uh, I actually don't know, uh, I'm not an oracle, uh, I don't know how this conflict uh, long, but I hope it won't be the uh, first conflict of many. Uh, when we look at the series of wars in history, uh, that could be uh, larger conflicts 
uh, and I hope uh, this will end uh, soon. Uh, and I think everybody wants uh, this solution. But I don't know how, how, how the diplomacy uh, will prevail or not, but probably uh, His Excellency Ambassador will, will uh, say more comprehensive solutions. Not because of screaming. Not because of screaming, okay. So, yeah. You reminded me and I, uh, about my personal touch with war. Uh, I uh, came to Belgrade in uh, October '87, started my diplomatic career there, and then I was posted as a Yugoslav consul in Dragovut in Austria. Uh, the former Yugoslavia had that practice that in consulates in neighboring countries there were consuls from those republics, Slovenes in Trieste and then in Dragovut. Macedonians in Saloon, etc., Serbs in Timisha, etc. And I started Slovene, Belgian, Christianity, Yugoslav Kosovo, in Klagenfurt on Thursday, 27th of June 91, when war in Slovenia started. This is my personal experience as well. Uh, I think that this winter should be used to maximum point for a diplomatic. Uh, for the negotiations between the two sides and to find a solution. Because winter is not in favor of any fighting, né? there is always a stalemate. We know this from history. Né? Moscow twice né? with Napoleon and with Hitler, starting up and so on. So, so uh, I think that uh, most probably this will happen. Of course we know, but I think this most probably will happen. If this does not happen, then there will be a, there will be or already is, but it, it will continue to be uh, uh, the Vietnam of the 21st century. This, this is my, my understanding at the moment. Uh, this, what uh, Turkey is doing, and then basically President Erdogan, I met him, by the way, about 15 times, so in person or in such a group right here. Uh, this is an extraordinary example of uh, how a leader got the global reputation uh, should behave. And especially this, what you said, uh, President Erdogan said many times uh, territorial integrity, no war, no uh, nuclear arms, and so on. So this, he was basically very in favor explicitly for this, what is, one could say, Ukrainian case. Right? Uh, this is very important, having in mind that the relation between <coughs> both presidents, uh, Erdogan and Putin, is very strong, they are very close, and this shows how leaders should behave. Uh, well, uh, there are a few leaders, né? Xi Jinping, uh, who, who I, I think uh, could have the most dominant uh, influence on bringing both sides of the negotiation table. I don't think Indian Prime Minister Modi is going that far. Uh, as mentioned before, the Brazilian president just started his term, but he and Putin knows themselves from early times. So I think within this circle, the, the uh, approach to uh, persuade both sides to, to sit down and negotiate, uh, we, we should find it. I think winter, coming winter, is speaking in favor of this. Is it time for, for diplomacy? Yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, about the role of Turkey, so we have started in reverse order to answer your questions. So okay. It's up to you. Uh, okay. You okay. Your, your uh, I will continue this uh, subject. I totally agree that Turkey could play the role of political mediator, and this country could be a successful political mediator, in my opinion, humble opinion. This is totally in compliance with the Hague. A convention of Peaceful Settlement of uh, International Dispute from 1907. So it's high time this convention to be applied in practice. I'm, I a little bit apologize uh, for going to your territory, Your Excellency, but uh, it's also a legal issue. This convention exists more than a century and it has not been used enough uh, that's why we have been uh, so many times in wars. Uh, why, why war if we have uh, these options of uh, conciliation, uh, 
of a peaceful settlement of disputes, even car disputes uh, like uh, that, that one. Uh, from the other side, I do believe um, and I know that political mediation is a hard job. It's not always uh, successful, yes. But definitely, it is much, much better than war. Definitely. We should try with this. And every country, every um, leader, every respected person is much more acceptable uh, to play this role uh, of mediator than to continue with the war. Why not Turkey? If any hidden agenda, I do not know, this is not a problem. This is always the case. Much more important is that uh, we go to the end of the war in this peaceful manner, and it is good for the mankind, not only for the region, not only for the two uh, countries. So strongly in favor of the role of Turkey as political mediator. About the, the second question, may I answer immediately? When the world will end. Yes, yes. I have, I have taken the microphone, so it's uh, very difficult to take uh, it from me. <laughs> about uh, maybe you can also use the example of Bulgaria. Uh, how the Balkan countries can can uh, react if there is uh, some other, let's say, security problems. Uh, I I will answer, some. but first I in I, the, I in the future. Yes, yes. But firstly, I would like to you say can. what I have in my mind. Uh, because it is end we of the day. Deal, we cannot deal with inflation right now, but what will happen if it continues to grow? Oh, I am not economist, and I will give you a little bit different opinion. Uh, but in any case, uh, as a university professor, I will try to answer. If, even that, if there is no answer of the question, I will try to, to give an answer. So this is, um, yeah. It comes with a professor. teacher's yeah. philosophy. <laughs> yes, it's, uh, a, it's a good good answer when it opens at least three additional questions. Oh yes, yes. But to uh, to your question about uh, the development, about the winter, about um, at the end of the war, the energy, energy crisis. Okay, okay. Yes, I will not forget on this. I have thought a little bit on this. Uh, I strongly wish the war to come to an end uh, with the help of Turkey or in any other way. Definitely uh, it's uh, the preferred decision, but I'm not a prophet Muhammad and I cannot predict it all. Uh, so, but nevertheless I remain a moderate optimist and I will uh, explain why. I personally am a mediator, not political mediator, but in everyday disputes, and we are obliged, all mediators are obliged to be optimists. Otherwise, we cannot do this job. So, I'm optimist about the future better development for many reasons. First of all, we have no many options. We cannot live in the underground as in the famous Emir Kosturica movie, we cannot go in the, in the underground. We cannot store food and energy at all uh, for a long time. Uh, we cannot go to the moon or the planet Mars. Uh, Elon Musk cannot take all of us immediately there. So we have to find another decision. And my answer is we have to follow the scientific and technology progress. And directly to your question, uh, I think that the whole of humankind should work for diversification of energy resources because the energy is the most important in this uh, situation. Uh, and the diversification is important to reduce dependency. And I will go a little bit further knowing that it's a risky job. Uh, I am not against Green Deal, <laughs> well-known Green Deal, but this is not the practical decision at that moment because it is proven that it's a tiny part of um, energy resources. Uh, these solar, wind installations, uh, they produce a tiny part of the energy. But 
we have to move to another mm, innovative ideas like geothermal resources, for example, as I know and as I have investigated. Uh, we have to go to um, mini nuclear reactors, modern wood, so called modern wood. So, this is, uh, of course, a long term decision. This is not for this winter. Definitely, it will not be, not all these decisions will be found dead to winter. Uh, but in that case, what to do? You are uh, asking the right question. And my opinion is that we should stay together in good contact, especially we, the people from the Balkan, in good contact and ready for mutual help and immediate response. Bulgaria, for example, uh, can produce more energy that we need. Why not conclude a good agreement with uh, the neighboring country uh, uh, and offer some of our energy? Definitely Turkey can produce food for us, all of us. <laughs> and we are, if we are in a good contact, if we are in a, uh, ready to cooperate, to offer mutual assistance, I think this, this is uh, our decision, immediate decision of the current crisis. That's my, that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I would like now to uh, uh, leave the floor to the audience for some comments and uh, questions. Yes. Uh, I want to ask about um, the case of Europe and Russia. Uh, because of the election, they okay. to hear you. I, I want to ask about uh, in the case of Europe and Russia, does sanctions, like implying the sanctions, or threat making threats about the sanctions are more effective? Because uh, maybe making threats about the sanctions can be more effective because after you've done the sanctions, you have nothing on your hand. I want to uh, see your opinions about that. Sorry. Will anyone take the first? <laughs> okay, I will take uh, yeah. briefly. I will answer. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, as you already know, I'm strongly against all we'll sanctions. Give you two certificates. That's why I mm, yes, I'm a restorativist. I'm uh, in favor of restorative ideology. So sanctions always. And specifically in that case, in my opinion, are counterproductive. They worsen the situation. I think this is not the best uh, idea to impose more and more sanction or to threat with sanctions. The decision is somewhere another place, maybe in diplomacy, maybe in restorative justice, but definitely not the sanction, in my legal opinion. If you want. You're leftist, you're showing this to me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a matter of discussion, of course, no? and the question, I will put it very, let's say, brutal way, what to do to stop killing? What to do? War is about killing. No? Each war means who will kill more. I mean, this is very brutal, and what to do to stop it? And if san sanctions could uh, add to stop or minimize that killing, they would. Negotiations. Yeah, but uh, we saw how many effort was invested from Turkey's side, that uh, there was a deal for uh, uh, freeing the harbors in, in Ukraine to, to, to send away crops. I mean, it was almost impossible. And this, this is only just a minor part of the effort needed to, to, to start the negotiations to end the war. Uh, I don't know what, what else to say, uh, but of course it is a huge challenge, those sanctions. Uh, they look rather comprehensive so far, I would say. And you know, this uh, energy crisis, food crisis and so on, I don't know, I don't have the exact uh, figures in my head, but I read somewhere that uh, Shell in the three quarters of this year, company, they, they, they are uh, sell out, or what is the term, 
was about 30 percentage lower, and the income was three times bigger. This does not have anything to do with the war in Ukraine. It cannot be the result of the war. And people are suffering because of this. So they're using the war as justification for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the ultimate aim, I think, should be to make peace. And the perfect peace, I think, is a peace which makes nobody really happy. So there should be concessions, there should be uh, difficult paths to achieve it. And I think sanctions or diplomatic, uh, uh, I don't know, pressures or even uh, threats could be part of it uh, to achieve that peace. That's my opinion. Thank you. Anyone else? I just want to kind of give a comment of course, on it because uh, yes. no, I think I'll no, you don't. Have to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you do not escape. Do not escape this. <laughs> so uh, the comment is that of course we all hate war. Of course we all want to say a sense of safety, a sense of like a, a peace. Uh, you know, for us to continue our lives. We all want to imagine futures in which we can build and grow and reach uh, some type of like uh, comfortable life. And of course, like the, the threat of war, like in a very close country, because like you know, as you mentioned at the beginning, like war exists, like uh, as as maybe like a slightly foreign concept, a concept that happens somewhere but not here. Um, and now the because like Ukraine is so close, it feels like the war is like almost at our doorstep. Um, so of course, like we don't want it. However, um, when uh, you are maybe like the leader of a, of a country that you think like you know deserves to be like uh, one that is the leader, uh, leader of all, and you are safe from you know, that killing, that energy crisis, that food crisis, it is very easy, I believe, to order for someone else, and not you, not anybody, you know, um, uh, when you won't experience a loss that will hurt you directly. Um, it's very easy to order someone to go and take like a territory. Because you want to, at the end of the day, like uh, prove that you know, like you now deserve to lead the world together, like you know, with your other neighbor who is also becoming stronger economically, and now you deserve, like you know, to be like those political uh, figures that people look up to. Uh, you know, like people like will need to learn like maybe Russian and Mandarin, like instead of like English in that sense. And so, uh, as you mentioned, like uh, maybe the the type of solution that would be happy, my uh, my like that would be peaceful, would be one that doesn't make anyone happy. But like those always have like a way of. of coming back in a way. Because like, what if uh, the peaceful resolution is that, let's say Russia like wants more territory, and then we agree, okay, like you get this piece of Ukraine, uh, and that means like, okay, like the war stops. But um, the only thing that's going to do is cause another war later on when people are gonna want to take the territory back. And peaceful, we're discussing peaceful negotiations, but we are thinking like, what is the goal? Um, because uh, if Russia wanted to take it like, uh, to enlarge its territories, it cannot do so peacefully. Uh, it cannot just like decide like okay like uh, peacefully so we don't kill anyone let's just take like all of these borders and make them you know as a part of ours so in that sense what we all want and what somebody else like who is safe from all of this like from all the damage that we all have to suffer uh wants um is not is not the same thing and therefore this war might very unfortunately like not end up in a way that is comfortable for the rest of us it might end up like uh, getting bigger because somebody who believes is strong enough like to make that happen wants that shift in power. So those are my comments on it. Oh. You don't have to comment anything bad, but that is uh, it's not necessarily a question, but that is like my perspective on it. No comment. There might not be a peaceful revol uh, resolution when the, the thing that people are looking for is not peace, uh, when it's a power shift. Like, you cannot get a power shift peacefully. And we're all going to suffer the consequences for it, is, is my opinion of Professor Medvedev, yes. If our, our Vice Rector, Professor Medvedev. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just uh, thank, you, thank you very much, first of all. Very much delighted individually, as I view, to listen to your speeches and the panel with the rebuttals amongst you, uh, basically having consensus. Uh, do you think that the, because you haven't touched at all the energy crisis, energy specifically in terms of rules, do you think that EU totally failed in terms of sanctions since you opened this issue 
and uh, it failed because of having no alternatives specifically to the gas uh, pipelines. So it seems to me that you are sanctioning a country that once again you are buying gas all the time from it and it doesn't have any, any, any content there. Do you think that EU totally failed in, uh, in terms of diversifying the routes of gas and oil pipelines? And all these 20 years, it seems to me, have monopolized and working only with Russian Federation in terms of oil and gas. Do you think that playing with the Caucasus states or with the MENA region would be much more better in terms of, let's say, Nabucco? If Nabucco would have been alive today, he would have had an alternative, gas lines and so on and so forth. Do you think that these sanctions have a problem because totally EU was very related to the energy resources from Russia? Thank you very much. I'll just leave this in the middle and whoever wants to can take it. <laughs> oh, it's... Oh, please, your red sauce. You know, it's, uh, it's a difficult issue. We are much energy specialists, but basically, uh, uh, the EU, I think that uh, this so far war, ex war experience and the issue of, of sanctions showed that Europe is EU. EU is at the end of the day capable of coordinating approach and facing the challenge. These are not phrases, you see. I don't know when we uh, uh, saw the EU working so uh, unanimously in facing something, a challenge, a threat, a threat. Uh, the dependence on Russian energy has fallen to minimum, I think. Or, or it's the opposite. No. At least if we can believe these figures in the media, in the, in the media. So, the, the, uh, the, I don't know. Um, All the countries are stocking the, the gas, so they are buying much higher than compared to the previous years. But, but not Russian ones. Not Absolute Russian ones. Okay, then you don't answer. Then you don't answer this <laughs> no, no, no. Because you have two alternatives. You have the American liquid gas and you have Russian. No, it's only. It's Norway is also. also but you know, I said it's two expert issues. So, uh, we can discuss this for a long time, but uh, since obviously you are an expert, I'm not. But I think that basically Europe would uh, uh, show the very uh, coordinated approach to the challenges that war is posing. But of course, you never can predict anything, and there are so, so many side effects. Uh, as I, I mentioned, this with uh, the companies like Shell earning huge money uh, that, that doesn't have to do anything with war. It shows, you know, that, uh, and not to, not to uh, keep in mind the, the, the climate change eh? and, and the, uh, 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 the, the, the promises to, to decarbonize, to, to, to uh, uh, lower the uh, uh, consumption of, of fuel and uh, energy sources. So uh, this all shows that, that these are global solutions that demand global approach and how to achieve this global approach uh, in a, such a contradictory division of powers. You know, this, uh, the, we can say from one point of view that humanity is at a big test right now. And numbers up and down, it doesn't make uh, much difference. There should be a global uh, agreement how to end this issue. That's it. And I think that uh, also, it is not possible to end this war without a global agreement, global pressure, or, or whatever. Uh, this is what you ask, uh, uh, Abnora. Yeah, the, but I think that in each war, we can see that the, uh, more, the more the war develops, or how should I say, uh, the more there are chances that the solution comes out. At certain stage, both parties will see that it's enough, they will sit down at, at the table. When this will happen, we don't know. I hope that winter will be that determin determining, determining factor that will uh, brought them to, to the table, but we don't know. But as I said, uh, the, 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 uh, the closest approximation for me is the war in Vietnam. No? Viet Viet Vietnamization. Vietnamization. And one of the lessons of the Vietnam War is also from Vietnam War, war on, there is a proportion of 1 to 10, so the invader has to, has to have at least 10 times more troops to invade 
the, 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 the target, and this is not possible. So, sooner or later, both parties will sit down and negotiate the table. It's just an, the question of the price. Eh? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. If you want to, yes, if you want to say anything. Or uh, anything only, or only briefly. Uh, uh, to your question, no, no, it's nevertheless. Not, it's not compulsory. Yes, yes. yes and, uh, no, I'm feeling obliged to answer. <laughs> I'm feeling obliged. Although in this uh, this time, I will give a very ambivalent answer, because uh, as a representative of the EU uh, member state, I cannot say that uh, the EU totally fell. This is forbidden. <laughs> but in any case, I think that the EU didn't find the best decision in that case. And the situation with the COVID crisis was more or less the same. Uh, we did, uh, the EU was not ready for this pandemic, of course, not for this war. And uh, finding solution in movements, it's a hard job, of course. At that moment, uh, I again repeat, the sanctions are not the decision, mediation, agreement, cooperation, somehow, that's the way that I see. And I wouldn't like, wouldn't like to agree with you that the, the war will further develop. I would like the war to stop. And I maybe, would like you to, but... Yes, and we have to call Beatles, maybe, <laughs> on help. We have to make laugh, not war. Not many of them. However, yes. there are some. Anthony some. Has, a, has a question. Some. Oh. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you, professors, for your uh, very delighted discussion. Uh, what I wanted to, to emphasize something that is uh, really problematic and to be in continuation with what. Uh, our colleague I know I just said is that the most I can say not the most but one of the most problematic situations right now that we also face is the nuclear war so there have been many threats basically for establishing nuclear war and also the situation in Zaporizhia and situations like that and uh, there was also studies about the aftermath that the nuclear war, war will bring in this case. So my question is, what are the methods or the mechanisms that we can do to prevent this situation? Because if it happens, then there might be a lot of consequences. Consequences in the health of the individuals, and of course, it's not going to happen only in the countries, but also in all over the world. So, what are the mechanisms to prevent this this kind of this kind of war, this kind of problem, nuclear war? I would Thank you. kind of uh, add to that, and uh, because I want to say, is there a threat of nuclear war? Does this feel like it will be? Is there a threat of nuclear war? It is war? in the hidden agenda, maybe, for somebody, but... Okay. Does anyone want to take the answer? Um, I, 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 again, again, the last time I'm taking the floor, <laughs> last time today, uh, because uh, just uh, some personal experience, uh, but before this, we have to use all methods, all tools, all means to avoid, to prevent this development. Because I've been, I've been in Japan. I have been in Japan in the year 2009 for almost a year. And honestly, 70 years after the Second World War, they are still suffering from the consequences of the nuclear bomb. So, definitely we should do, not, not we exactly in this hall, but the whole politician, the elite, etc., etc., to avoid this, to prevent it. It's not allowed in this uh, world, in this development. I think in this respect, all means should be used, all possible means. I think only if I'm also the last one, the, the, the last one speaking. Yes, we can, we can, yes. We can yeah. go close up. Yeah. So, um, 
Of course, you never can exclude an option. Eh? This is at least in theory. But I think that after the uh, after uh, Biden and Xi Jinping met in face-to-face in -face life for the first time, two messages stood out from this point of view. What we are discussing: territorial integrity of Ukraine and no nuclear war allowed, or something like this. So I, I don't think that. Uh, uh, this was happened, but, but it, let's say two, three months before, earlier, it looked very likely, at least in the media. Eh? It was a high speculation. Maybe those speculations are also artificially provoked to water down the tensions and to bring some impressions. What could this mean? But I think about, uh, about I think that after that meeting between Biden and Xi Jinping, this would hardly be possible because. These are two, the two biggest, most influential countries in the world, the two most influential persons. Yeah. Putin is certainly a role, if we, if we could select, or uh, if we would rank to say so, practically. So I don't think this is an option. Well, thank you. Uh, well, nuclear war for a long time was a science fiction concept uh, in my childhood and uh, beyond, uh, like after the 90s, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed was forgotten, but now it's in the agenda again, okay? because both sides had the nuclear power. Uh, well, I agree with the ambassador, it seems to be uh, unlikely, because uh, it's like this new TV series, House of Dragon, nobody wants to use their dragons, because if they use the dragons, the, the, the earth will be demolished, uh, and the nuclear weapons are like that. But maybe, maybe they are uh, the media or Maybe there is an agenda to raise the awareness about uh, the nuclear war and what can we do about that. But perhaps we can talk about it. Uh, there is nothing wrong with talking about it because it seems nobody wants uh, another Hiroshima. Uh, but it is a possibility, it's a distant possibility, as long as uh, countries uh, own these weapons. Uh, but personally, I don't believe it will happen. Thank you. So on that positive note, <laughs> yes, that's a good moment to close. It goes up, right? Yes. Uh, dear dear uh, professors, uh, thank you. Thank, thank you for, uh, for your speeches today. Thank you for your discussions. Uh, we really have uh, learned a lot. We, um, uh, thank you for sharing your ideas uh, with us, your concepts, uh, some interesting quotes that I will remember for a long period of time. Uh, and I'm sorry uh, because it, I know it was really exhausting day for you. I uh, can have a have a rest. And uh, thanks again. It was a it was a pleasure of mine to to be here with you. Our pleasure. No, like it wasn't just good. It was excellent. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.